Faith and obedience, how important that is, and how often we think we're walking by faith, but we're not obeying, and so we are not really walking by faith. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. Tonight we're again continuing in that uh, incredible sermon on Mars Hill, Acts chapter 17, looking tonight, the Lord willing, at verses 30 through 34. Acts chapter 17 and verses 30 through 34. As you're turning there, we'd like to very quickly remember what we saw last time together, which was all the way back on March 22nd, so it's been a while. But uh, we talked about general revelation and common grace, a very important topic in Reformed circles, because there are certain uh, in the Reformed circles who absolutely reject and scream and yell about and kick and fuss and fight uh, and claim there is no common grace. And what we tried to demonstrate last time was that there is common grace, but not of the Arminian sort. There is common grace that even those who believe squarely in predestination, those who believe in election, those who believe in the sovereignty of God, can recognize without giving in to the Arminian delusions that people are somehow able without any divine aid to come to the Savior. And that is not the correct understanding of common grace. It's a straw man against which those who reject common grace entirely are fighting. So I'll start reading back here in verse 27. That they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. Now, as we look at this passage here, or as we looked at it, and I'm just going to review very quickly so that it will give us a background for what we want to talk about tonight, uh, we need to understand that there are certain aspects of grace that God has extended to all men everywhere things which actually benefit reprobate pagans, things which actually extend blessings to them, things that provide for them, things that make their lives better and easier, things that give them greater opportunity to hear, understand, and believe the gospel, even though they never will believe because they are unregenerate and dead in trespasses and sins, not sick. We started with definitions to avoid misunderstanding. This is how I'm defining common grace because, of course, there's the hyper-reformed position that says God only extends grace to the elect, but there's also the unbiblical Arminian position. The Arminian view of common grace asserts that all men at birth are so wrought upon by the Holy Spirit that they are freely capable of an unhindered response to the gospel invitation. It's not true, because unregenerate men are dead in trespasses and sins. Not sick, dead in trespasses and sins. In other words, without the external work of the Spirit of God in the heart, using the Word of God, because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, not only will they not believe, but they are incapable of believing. And the context that Paul's preaching here is very critical. We talked about Paul being the super holy separated Jew who thought of his ancestry as much better than everybody else's, and he talks about that in, in the book of Galatians. We'll not go back there again today. But here he's talking to this mixed bag of Gentiles. He's talking to them in the context of pagan idols that are surrounding them. Jews who didn't mix their blood with other nations. They were the super separatists. And yet, the astounding and overwhelming reach of what Paul is preaching here is what has been termed common grace, as we defined it uh, two weeks ago. Let me summarize it quickly for you. Verse 27a, what we learned, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him. That's the immediate phrase after the statement that God made all humans with the same blood. Here we're told the reason that because God has made of one blood all nations for to dwell upon the face of the earth, a scientific fact, that this is one of the mechanisms that he has given to man to realize that there is a God whom men should seek. Because we are of one blood, that is of human blood, God has common grace to us going back to the various pre-Abrahamic covenants. In other words, God made a covenant with Adam, who was the father of both elect and non-elect. God made a covenant with Noah, who is the father of both elect and non-elect. God made a covenant with Abraham, the father of both elect and non-elect. 
We have Ishmael and Isaac, you recall. When we move into the New Testament, we find Jesus referring to the elements of grace and blessings that are extended to unbelievers, things that we would call common grace, grace that's available to all people. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, You've heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Verse 45 that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. In other words, that's a reflection of the way God treats those who hate him. That's grace. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. God does it for those who will never make it to heaven. Amazing, isn't it? He doesn't just send rain on the people. He says, well, those are my elect, and so therefore, you know, they get this special com this special grace. Nobody else gets any grace. Jesus goes on, for if you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so. In other words, to say that God only extends some grace to you guys but there's no possibility that he could extend the grace to anybody else. He said, that would put God in the same category as a publican. That would put God in the same category as people who are evil. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Yes, we are to reflect the way in which God treats those who will never make it to heaven those who are declared our enemies, those that curse us, those that hate us, those that use us despitefully, those that persecute us, to reflect our Heavenly Father. God commands us to do good to our enemies because he does to good to his enemies by gracious acts provided through his creation, and that's why we mirror it. Paul found, uh, referred to this back in Acts chapter 14, this exactly same doctrine. When the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lacaoni, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates, and would have done sacrifice with the people, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do you these things? We also are of men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, and here it is, the common grace. He left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. The second thing that we learned as we looked at that passage last week in verse 27b, it says, though he be not far from every one of us. That means that God is close. That means that God is knowable. That means that God is not hiding. The character of God is visible through the creation that we can see all around us. That's certainly common grace that God has given to all men to make them accountable for knowing him. And Paul, in Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3, gives us three aspects of grace which are extended to all men. Number one, the light of creation. That when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. They rejected that grace that was extended to them. They didn't want that grace that was extended to them, but it was grace extended to them. He gave them intelligent minds so that they can look into the creation and that they can see God is there. They can look and see a reflection of his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse, Romans 1.18. The second thing is Romans chapter 2. God has given them the light of conscience. That is grace. He didn't have to give them consciences. He could have made them just like the animals. Said, you know, in the end, I'm going to throw you all into hell. I'm not going to give you a conscience. I don't want you to know that I'm here. I want you to just go through life thinking that there is nothing else but this material world. I'm not going to give you a conscience. But God gave them a conscience. And their conscience accuses them or approves them. And every man makes choices based on the God given conscience that God has entrusted to them. Many of them sear their consciences, which means their past feeling but they have a conscience to start with. It's not enough to save them, but it is enough to tell them that what they're doing is wrong. That there is a difference between right and wrong. 
there are some absolute standards out there, even though they cannot figure out why exactly there should be, because they don't have that foundation, and that's what Paul is dealing with here in Acts chapter 17. But they know that there are certain things that are intrinsically wrong and right. The third, of course, is special revelation, and that's the law, which is Romans chapter 3. The law condemns that which is unrighteous, and by extension, the gospel of the New Testament, which are command we are commanded to preach, where? Only to the elect. You must go find the elect first, and then you can preach the gospel. Is that what it says? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, what? To every creature. That's right. You see, God didn't put polka dots and purple stripes down the back of those who are elect. We don't know who they are. And so we indiscriminately preach the gospel because we do not know who God will draw to himself. We know, though, that we must preach it. We must preach the word of God because God uses his word to draw sinners. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so we proclaim it. That is grace because God is pouring it out on some people who will never believe. But it is available. And if we're doing our job, it's a common grace that reaches every human being on the planet. That's what we were sent to do, you know. Too often we think that, well, you know, I got reached, so why do I have to worry about it from now on? My neighbor, well, you know, once I sort of smiled at them, so maybe that's my witness. Okay, they see I'm a smiley Christian. Hi, over there. <laughs> yeah, hi, neighbor. I walk him over and have a beer. Oh, I don't drink it. No, no, no. <laughs> and then we run back into our house and we're all scared that, man, I hope that was a good enough testimony. But at least they know I don't drink the beer. <laughs> Common grace that God would actually keep them alive. In fact, many of them live very long lives. God is keeping them from hell even just a little bit longer than perhaps they might otherwise have had opportunity. Dear people, we serve a God who is good and is kind. He judges sin. There comes a time, and we'll talk about that tonight because that's in our text for tonight, there comes a time when there is a point of no return. But we serve a God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Now I know there are people who like to say, God so loved the world of the elect. That is not what it says. You are adding to Scripture. And you know what the book of Revelation says about adding to that book. That's the last book of the New Testament. You add anything after that was written, and you're in trouble. You take anything away from that after that was written, you're in trouble. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. My devotions the other day, I was reading through the story about the, the this rich young guy that comes to Jesus, and he, he really wants to uh, you know follow Jesus, and he wants to go to heaven. And Jesus says, well, do this. You know, How about the commandments about honoring your father and mother? Yeah. How about the no no adultery? Yeah, that's okay. Uh, how about the, you know, don't kill? Yeah, that's okay. I'm pretty good. Jesus says, you lack one thing. Go sell everything that you've got and give to the poor and come and follow me. And it says, that young man went away sorrowful for he was very rich. But you know what fascinates me in that context? Before Jesus tells him to do that, it says Jesus loved him. And it uses the word agapao. That's agape kind of love. That's the divine kind of love. That's the love that Christians are supposed to have in 1 Corinthians 13. That's the kind of love that God expresses. It says, Jesus agapao him. But it's a young man who went away. He rejected. Because he was tied down with a different God. He had the idol of the world. He had the idol of covetousness. He had the idol of money flashing before his eyes. The coins clinking in the bottom of his little barrel. But Jesus loved him. The text says so. Did Jesus give him opportunity? Yes. Did Jesus make it clear? Yes. Did Jesus make a genuine offer? Yes. And when we share the gospel with those who are not elect, we make a genuine offer. 
even if they reject it. I know too many people who say, well, we can never preach the gospel that Christ died for their sins because, after all, we don't believe he died for their sins unless they're among the elect. He only died for the sins of the elect. Dear friends, that's not the way Paul preached. You sure don't see that here in Acts 17. That's not the way that Jesus preached. You don't see that in any of his messages throughout the Gospels. That's not the way that Peter preached. We share the Gospel with everybody because we do not know who the elect are. And we can definitely tell them, yes, Christ died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again. He loved you. Now will you receive his offer of eternal life? You know, the Word of God is not like the mystery religions. It's not a hidden message. It's not an esoteric message. It's not something that you have to have a mystical understanding like some of these books that are coming out now that give you all these codes to the Bible and certain hidden things about blood moons and all the... There's all kinds of stuff out there like that, that right now. I mean, there are a lot of people making a lot of money on that. The Word of God is plain and simple and it's up front. And you don't have to twist it and find hidden meanings in it and spell words backward in Hebrew and upside down and all that kind of stuff and put them together in little, you know, boxes and squares and, you know, do like the crossword puzzle kind of thing to see if it's there. There is some of those things in Scripture where you'll find the name of Jehovah, for example, even though it's not written in the book of Esther. But, you know, that's not, that's not the way God wrote the Bible. He wrote it so we would understand it, so we would believe it, so that we could present it to someone who doesn't happen to be, you know, 180 IQ. He wrote it so a child can understand it. Suffer little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Well, I didn't mean to spend that much time on that. That was more than a review. That was We added a few things there. Um, but then down to verse 28, For in him we live and move and have our being. That's the most asp uh, obvious aspect of common grace, which is the sustenance of all human life, not merely the lives of those who are the elect. We all in him live and move and have our being. He is the one who sustains us, and he sustains the non-elect too. We learn the principle of common grace that we've been called into acts with our interact with our culture and the people who are around us, as certain also of your own poets have said. And we talked about how that was a fascinating insight into the education of the Apostle Paul. He's quoting here uh, Greek writings, poets, scientists. Uh, he's quoting not the, just the big ones. He's quoting a couple of little ones. He's not just, you know, alluding to them. He's actually giving quotes, which means he memorized those things. And we talked about how some of those poets had made observations on the state of man and the creation that reflected their innate understanding that God had placed into all men to make all men accountable by their light of conscience. And that itself is the mercy of common grace. We saw that Paul was quoting two poets. The Greek poet Aretas of Cilicia who was about 270 B.C. and Cleanthes, who was about 300 B.C., who uses almost identical words. You know, do you know enough about the people in the culture around you to pinpoint citations of scholars that they respect who have admitted that their own worldviews are inadequate. For example, evolution versus creation. That is the big issue, folks, if you don't know it. That is the big issue in our culture today. That is why we have the problems with same-sex marriages, is because we've rejected what Genesis says. That's the reason that we have problems with nude beaches, because Genesis is the foundation for clothing. That's the reason that we have rebellion in families, because God established the family in Genesis, but you reject that and you no longer have any form of authority. Everything goes back to Genesis. Every foundational issue that we face today goes back to Genesis. And creation versus evolution is the key. It is the wedge that Satan has driven into our society. Do you know who you can quote? among any of the evolutionists? Do you know any facts, specific facts, that when somebody comes up to you and says, you know, the Earth is four and a half billion years old, although they're saying it's older than that now because they're beginning to realize that four and a half billion years is not quite enough time to be able to get it evolved. Well, it's not enough time anyway. No matter how you look at it, you've got to start with non-life and bring out life. And, you know, more difficult than that, you have to start with something 
which is non-life. So where did the something come from? Do you know how far the Earth is from the Sun? Do you know how many miles per year the Sun shrinks in its radius? And if the Earth were four and a half billion years old, and I'll tell you it's four and a half miles per year that it shrinks in its radius, nine, nine, nine miles per year that it shrinks in its diameter, Four and a half billion years ago, if you multiplied that radius, because that edge is, here's the Earth and here's the Sun, and it was out here someplace and it's shrinking back this direction. Four and a half billion years ago, multiply five, that's an easier number to multiply by. Four and a half billion years. How far is the Earth from the Sun? 93 million miles. Where would four and a half billion years ago put the Earth squarely inside the middle of the Sun with the edge of the Sun way out here? Now folks, you need to learn a few facts because you live in a culture that has been brainwashed could you as Paul had done here engage the people around you we need to be skilled in demonstrating the still visible vestiges of the truth that the pagans have been trying to suppress Paul talks about them suppressing the truth and show that their belief systems are totally corrupt Verse 28c, for we are his offspring, that is, God is the source of life. Verse 29a, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, he emphasizes the point. In other words, you admit my premise through your own poets that you believe, you can't deny my conclusions. Verse 29b, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. And that brings us to verse 30 tonight. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, the message tonight is repentance and judgment. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world by righteousness, by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men. And this is a great one for today, because today is Resurrection Sunday. In that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. We talked about that this morning, didn't we? So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men clave unto him, and believed, among the which was Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. You know, as we read this passage, and as we read it this morning, and we did read that one among the many, many passages talking about the resurrection, when we looked at the practical impact that the resurrection of Christ has on the future, and the way we now live in the present, that's in the middle of Paul's sermon on Mars Hill the impact of what it should do for us, the impact of what it should do in our testimony when we try to evangelize the people who are lost. We saw that the ignorance of which Paul speaks here in that first verse, in the times of this ignorance God winked at, that ignorance we saw this morning was a willful ignorance. Paul uses a very interesting phrase there. I don't know if you noticed that. It says that God winked at this ignorance in time past. In other words, and here is an issue that clearly is common grace. God overlooked the form of rebellion because he was offering common grace to the unregenerates. They were in rebellion. He could have squashed them like a bug at the very first wiggle of their rebellion. But it says in times past, he winked at it. In other words, God overlooked it because he was giving them a genuine offer of salvation. But as in the things there, there always comes a cutoff point, a point of no return. Did you read the next phrase? After which God has ordained judgment. It says, Now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day. There's a cutoff point. There's a specific point in time in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given us assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. The resurrection is the proof that judgment is coming. We don't know when that point is. And so you know what? I think rather than stretching it, that we better not put God to the test. There is a point in time. It's a clearly determined point in time in advance. It's guaranteed by the character of God. When the last man, woman, or child will be saved, just like there was a point in time, a no turning back point, 
It was the tipping point in time when the last person got on board Noah's Ark and God shut the door. That's given as a picture of salvation in Scripture. There's coming a day, folks. There's coming a point in time when the very last man, woman, or child that's going to get saved before the rapture, before the judgment that comes upon the earth in the great tribulation period, there's going to come a point in time when people who have put it off and put it off and put it off and put it off and put it off are going to no longer have a chance. God shuts the door. Don't push your luck. You might be too late. When God shuts the door, nobody can open it. Revelation 3, 7, and 8. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. There's a God in heaven who does that. He may leave it open for a long time because he is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But there is coming a day when he will shut the door. And if you haven't trusted Christ by then, you're out. That's dangerous, folks. Don't play with God. That's what Paul's preaching here. We know there's a predetermined time set by God because he says so here. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world. Now, just as we saw this morning, the resurrection of Christ guarantees the future judgment of the world, which is the whole point that Paul's making here, of course. The resurrection is also essential to the Christian faith. It is the heart of the gospel, as well as being the heart of Christian living. It is the heart of the eternal expectation of the believer. But it is also the heart of the doctrine of judgment to come. We see that the resurrection is key to the gospel by which we're saved. And so Paul is emphasizing the resurrection at this point. He's trying to see people come to Christ. Paul says it's the heart of the resurrection in both 1 Corinthians 15 and Romans chapter 1. Listen. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. So are we talking about the gospel of salvation here? Everybody thinks we're talking about the gospel of salvation. Please wave your hand. What? Nobody out there is going to wave hands? Oh, we have a few hands. Okay. Yes. Some people don't think we're talking about the gospel of salvation here, I guess, in 1 Corinthians 15. The gospel which I preached unto you, which you received, wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. That's the gospel of salvation. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture. Here it is, verses 3 and 4. This is the gospel. you got the gospel in a nutshell here, who Jesus is and what he did. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That's the gospel Paul preached. That's the gospel they received. That's the gospel in which they stood. That's the gospel by which they were saved. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and was buried, and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. He says the same thing in Romans chapter 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto thee, gospel of God, which he had a promise to put afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Do you understand why Paul is preaching it in Acts 17? That's the heart of the gospel. The resurrection guarantees salvation. We also saw this morning that the resurrection is the key to the Christian life. We saw this morning as well that the resurrection is the key to eternal expectations for the believer in heaven. Additionally, we saw this morning that the resurrection is central to the New Testament doctrine of judgment to come, which is what Paul is using it for him to warn them of judgment to come. Now, I want to address a problem that I see in a lot of so-called evangelism today. That is, we need to remember that evangelism does not always need to be sweet and rosy. God has a wonderful plan for your life. He can enhance your enjoyment and give you friends. He can solve all those problems you're having with your girlfriend or boyfriend. He does really nice things for his followers if you'll just let him try. Or how about the so-called prosperity gospel? Follow Jesus and he will make you rich. Follow Jesus and you will never be sick. This morning I had a vision and Jesus told me to tell you to send your seed money to Bawana Huncho's new jet plane and watch the money roll into your bank account. 
There is an evangelist so-called out there right now that's telling his followers to send in money for a seven million dollar jet for him. And if you do, that seed money, you're planting seeds of faith and suddenly your money will begin to grow. Folks, that is not the gospel. Evangelism, evangelism does not always need to be sweet and rosy, and Paul is not making it sweet and rosy here as he preaches to these Greek pagans with all their false gods, and he's standing in their midst in a very dangerous location where if they get mad at him, they can kill him and throw him off the edge of the cliff. He wasn't preaching it to pacify them, to give them a bunch of sweet platitudes, to make it sound like, well, if you just come to Jesus, he'll make everything okay for you. You don't see that happening to Paul as he goes through the book of Acts. Jesus didn't make everything okay for Paul. Jesus didn't make everything rosy and easy for Paul. And yet Paul faithfully preached the gospel of Christ. There's a lot of phony evangelism today that never mentions judgment. So much of that so-called evangelism never warns people to flee from the wrath to come. Paul wasn't at all hesitant to turn up the heat of approaching judgment to warn people to trust the risen Christ. Because failure to do so results in Christ being your judge when God brings the world to a screeching halt. Peter says that same thing as well. Second Peter chapter 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. What did some of them do when they heard about the resurrection? They mocked, didn't they? Others said, we'll hear you more on this matter. But some of them just mocked. In the last days there will come scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Do you understand what that principle is that is stated in that verse? That's what's called uniformitarianism. In other words, long periods of time with little teeny bits of change in between, which is what evolution is based upon, which is the uniformitarian hypothesis, that if you just give it a long enough period of time, time is the hero of the plot, and you can get from here to there. If you have a very good imagination, uh, you can get from here to there. If you can come up with some way that we can get life started over here, you can come from here to there if you've got uniformitarianism. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. And he's putting it in the context of creation and the flood. Listen to this. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. That's creationism. Did you know they were fighting this same fight back there 2,000 years ago? Did you know that there were some ancient Greek philosophers who taught evolutionary theory? And God put this in the Bible so that we would know that's a common problem, and we need to know how to address it whereby the world that then was, and here we have the flood, which is the other thing that they attack. The world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. Did you know why God did those things? He tells us. He tells us that's because it's a warning about judgment to come. Look at verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly man. Peter doesn't pull any punches, does he? Paul didn't pull any punches either. Paul told them the way that it is, because unless a man knows that he's a sinner, unless a man knows that there is a judge who judges sin, unless a man knows that someday he will stand before his creator and give an account for what he has done, He'll think he doesn't need a savior. He'll think he's okay. He thinks he's as good as the guy next to him. And after all, if the guy next to him is pretty good, you know, then he feels pretty good about himself. And if he's a little better than the guy next to him, he figures, well, you know, you know, if the bear is coming after us and I'm just a couple of steps ahead, the bear will get him and I'll get away. Folks, it's not going to happen that way. Every one of us is going to stand before God and give an account for what we've done in this body. Every one of us will give an account as to whether or not we have faithfully witnessed not just to the saving grace of Christ, but the saving grace from what? Yes, he saves us from sin. Yes, he saves us from hell. He saves us from the judgment to come. 
Because there is, in fact, sin, there is a need for repentance, which is why Paul says he calls every man everywhere to repent. In other words, you guys standing here listening to my sermon on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17, you need to repent because there is coming a day Jesus rose from the dead and he's the judge. You can't keep him down. You can't shut him up someplace. He rose from the dead. That means that he's going to judge you because he paid for sins. And if you reject his payment, you are in serious trouble. You know, as we look at repentance, that call starts with the Old Testament prophets. That call continues through John the Baptist. That call to repentance continues with Jesus. That call to repentance continues with Paul and Peter and John in the book of Revelation. And it should be a part of our message as well. But sadly, unfortunately, we're too often trying to soft pedal the gospel so that nobody gets offended. Too often we're trying to tickle somebody's ears to win their friendship or their popularity. But repentance to avoid judgment is a major theme in the Bible. Repentance means turning about 180 degrees from the way you're going now and starting to walk and act and think and speak in the opposite direction. It means to change your attitudes, your motives, your impulses, your desires, your habits, the things that you lust for, your priorities, and your spending of God's resources. Repentance will make, you in, uh, will make a change in your character defects. It will make a change in the things that you love and put first in your life. It will make a change even in the things that you pray about so piously, pretending that you're spiritual when really what you need is repentance. Repentance means an entire sea shift in your life. Let me divide some of the key areas down into specific categories so that you can get a handle on what Paul is talking about here. What he's telling his audience that they must do. I'll just give you a few passages out of the Old Testament because of course God was always calling Israel to repentance in the Old Testament. But um, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 47, Yet if they shall bethink themselves in the land, whether they are carried captives. Now, just a question for you. Why did God allow the children of Israel, first the northern ten tribes, to be carried into Assyria, and then the southern two tribes to be carried into Babylon? Why did he let it happen? Was it because they were so good and he just wanted to see if, you know, if they were tough? Was that the reason? No. It was because they'd sinned. And God says, all right, I'm teaching you a lesson. And the way that you learn the lesson and show me that you've learned the lesson is when you repent. Listen to what he says. If they shall bethink themselves in the land whither they were carried captives and repent and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captives, saying, we have sinned and done perversely. We have committed wickedness. If they do that, God will restore them. You see, that's what repentance is all about. Job. After the book of Job, we come to the end. And God speaks to Job. And Job says, Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job thought he was good. Job couldn't figure out, Why in the world is God smacking me around? Job didn't really understand just how deeply sin permeates even good people. Ezekiel 14, verse 6. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord, Repent, and turn from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. Repentance means to turn. You're going this way, and you turn about this way. That's what repentance is all about. Chapter 18, verse 30. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent, and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Yeah, God called Israel to repentance. As we move to the New Testament, repentance was the message of John the Baptist. Matthew 3, 2. And saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse 11 of chapter 3. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Mark chapter 1, verse 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. Luke says it too. And he came into all the country about Jordan preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. The book of Acts makes reference to John. Chapter 13. When John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. Chapter 19. Paul is still referring to it all the way down in Acts chapter 19. 
Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ. Say, well, that was John the Baptist, but he's Old Testament. Okay. Jesus preached repentance. Matthew 4.17 From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent! For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The very first words that we have coming out of Jesus' mouth from that time forward is repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Mark chapter 1 verse 15 And saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. It was the message that Jesus gave to the disciples to preach. Mark 6.12 And they went out and preached that men should repent. Preaching repentance was part of Christ's great commission. Not the one in Matthew, but the one over in Luke. Luke 24, 47. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Repentance is the only way to escape judgment in hell. Jesus said so, Luke chapter 13. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Verse 5, he said it again. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Chapter 16, verse 30. And here we find the story of Lazarus and the rich man, and the, the Lazarus dying and being carried by the angels into the bosom of Abraham. We talked about it at the sunrise service this morning. It says, and he said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And they didn't. Because one came unto them from the dead. Jesus did. Repentance is the key to the experience of the benefits of forgiveness. Luke 17, 3 and verse 4. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. Repentance is the key to receiving forgiveness. If he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Very interesting that the Lord Jesus Christ ties those things together. Did you know that repentance is one of the basic beginner doctrines of the New Testament? Hebrews 6.1 says so. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. That's the word teleos. That's maturity. Not laying again the foundation. You start with foundations when you're building a building. You don't start building the 32nd floor first and work your way down. You start with the foundation, don't you? Listen. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Two key elements in the foundation. Repentance and faith toward God. He says, look, we, you don't have to hammer that anymore. That's the foundation. We need to go on unto maturity. That's not a matter of, well, when I get really spiritually mature, then I will repent. Wrong. That starts down at the bottom. That's the foundation. Repentance is central to the principal sermons in the book of Acts. We find it in chapter 2, verse 38. Peter said unto them, Repent. Acts chapter 3, 19. Repent and be converted. Acts chapter 8, verse 22. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness. Acts 5, 31. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. Acts eleven eighteen. And when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Acts 17.30 And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Acts 26.20 20. But showed first unto them at Damascus, as Paul speaking, and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, and do works meet for repentance. Do you get the idea? It was sort of central to the preaching, the different sermons that you find recorded for you in the book of Acts. Did you know that Paul clearly preached repentance in the age of grace? Testifying both to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter, chapter 26, verse 20, But showed first unto them at Damascus, and then at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Romans 2, 4, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to... Anybody? Repentance! That's squarely in the middle of this church age. That's the book of Romans, solid doctrinal teaching. That you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by it in nothing. The goodness of God leads you to repentance. 2 Corinthians 7.10 For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. 2 Timothy 2.25 In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God for adventure will give them repentance, to the acknowledging of the truth. 2 Corinthians 7, 9. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. Peter preached repentance. 
Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Repentance can come too late. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 17. Speaking of Esau, who sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. That's the warning Paul's giving here in Acts chapter 17. God has winked at it long enough. God is now calling on everywhere, every man everywhere, to repent. You don't know when the final breath comes for you. You don't know if you're ready. If you haven't trusted Christ, if you haven't repented from your sins, if you haven't turned away from all that you used to be and turned to Christ, that's what repentance is about. You're turning to Christ. You're in serious trouble. It can be too late. Hebrews 6, 6. If they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Repentance is a key requirement to escape judgment in the prophetic book of Revelation. Beginning in chapter 2. Remember, therefore, and this is to the churches. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. You see, repentance deals with something that you've been doing that you shouldn't have been doing. Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place. That was dealing with a church that was going to get canned by Christ. Will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. That's a letter to the churches, including Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood. I will jerk you off the playing field, says Jesus. Verse 16, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the mouth with the sword of my mouth. Again, to the churches. Verse 21, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Verse 22, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Chapter 3, verse 3, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Verse 19, Do you know why Jesus does this? Why does Jesus want us to repent? He tells us in verse 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Repentance results in a changed life. And we'll close with two thoughts, that as the first, and then one final one with one verse. But repentance results in a changed life. Matthew 3, 8. Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet or fitting for repentance. Repentance changes your life. Matthew 9, 13. But go ye and learn what this meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Mark 2, 17. When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Luke 3, 8, Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. What God's looking for is a repentant heart and the repentant life. He says it again in Luke 5, 32. You get the idea? Jesus is talking in each of these passages that we've been quoting here, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And then the final thought. Repentance causes joy in heaven. Luke 15, 7. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Joy in heaven. When someone turns from their wicked ways and turns to Christ. Turning is what repentance is about. It's a change in life, not merely a change in theology. It's a change that affects your life. There's joy in heaven. 
Gracious Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for Paul's sermon here. It reminds us that preaching the gospel doesn't always have to be sweet and nice and puffy and cotton candy and so totally vague that nobody has any idea what we're talking about. Because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Because there is, in fact, a judgment day coming. It's been appointed. It's been determined. There will come a cutoff point. There will come a point of no return. That men and women and boys and girls need to right now pay attention to whether or not they're on the right direction, the right road, whether they have turned, whether in genuine faith they have turned to Christ, because genuine faith does show repentance. Father, we pray for your blessings on this, your word, as it's gone forth tonight, that our Lord Jesus Christ will be glorified in it, for we pray it in his name. Amen.